warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. As-salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Welcome everybody from around the world. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and this is, of course, the BAK Show. And we are very happy to have all of you um, to be joining us. Um, we're broadcasting live from northern Syria, and we are broadcasting on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, we're going to be talking about what's important to the Muslim Ummah and that which is important to you. We take your questions, your comments, your concerns. It is not a prerequisite that you agree with what we are with, 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 with what we are saying on the show. That's not a prerequisite. My brother used to say that if you've got two partners that always agree, you don't need one of them. And that's how we do here on the show. Um, if you've got something that you'd like to say, we'd be more than happy to put it up, um, you know, as long as the language and content is all respectful. This is a family show. Um, we don't have any problem with that. Uh, so that is the first thing. Um, we want to just give people an opportunity just to be able to tune in. Um, if you are out there, you can hear my voice. Why don't you send us a quick message? Assalamu alaikum. Um, also, if you want, why don't you tell us where you're watching from? That's always a good thing. Um, we want to get the algorithm going so that they will know that you're feeling good about this content and it will invite more people to join us. Yes. So that's where we are here. Uh, today, we got a bunch of different topics that we're going to be um, uh, talking about, uh, ranging from Gaza uh, to the Houthis and such like that. It's a lot of stuff that's going on. And we want to make sure that we stay focused because everyone, or I should say a lot of the powers that be are always trying to distract a little to the left, a little to the right. Don't worry. Don't pay any attention to those bombings. Don't listen to those people talking about uh, a, a famine. You, the, the pictures are made up. Um, they got these pictures from Rwanda or something like that. But wait a minute, the people are light skinned, they're Arabs. Uh, well, I'll pay no attention to that, all of that stuff, brothers and sisters. So we're going to stay focused and we are going to be committed to what we're doing here. All right, we want to just give people an opportunity to just send us that salam and we're going to get ready to get started here. Um, we've got uh, MLK. Sounds like Martin Luther King to me. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum from Sweden. May Allah reward you, brother. May Allah reward you also. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the message and the good vibe. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All right. <clears throat> um, uh oh, we've got Mwain who's here. And he's watching from Falls Church, Virginia. Mashallah. Back home, man. It's back home. All right, everybody. Let's talk about where we are. Um, as you know, let's just do a quick recap. The United Nations Security Council uh, gave a vote just yesterday on a um, demand for a ceasefire. Uh, it was 14 in favor of. Uh, no one was against. Uh, they basically said, we just let it pass. We're not for it. We're not against it. We just let it pass. And that's what took place yesterday. Um, some of the highlights of it is that it demanded um, an immediate uh, ceasefire for the month of Ramadan. Now, Ramadan's only about two more weeks left in it. So that kind of makes it a bit of a moot point anyway um, after Ramadan is over. Nobody could say to, okay, well, we need to uh, implement the Security Council resolution. But then the Israel is going to say, well, Ramadan's over. Which Ramadan are you talking about? So, you know, th there's a lot of game playing going on here. In addition to that, it also made mention that all hostages are released. Now, some of the language here is a bit ambiguous because the Israelis are going to say, see, release the hostages, the 130, 150, or whatever it is that you have left, release them. That's what the United Nations Security Council said. And the Palestinians are going to say, okay, fine, fair enough. Release the 9,000 uh, pr uh, 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 prisoners that you have in your prisons, 770 
alone that you arrested since the attacks of October the 7th, release those and we will, uh, and there'll be a compliance there. So there's gonna be some struggling going on in that regard. In addition to that, uh, it, it then goes on to mention that there's going to be some follow-up and so on and so forth. Okay, now that we've got all of that, and that happened just yesterday. Well, let's take a look and see what's happening on the ground. Well, on the ground, we've got 12 were killed in a bombing in Khan Yunus, um, an Israeli raid and airstrike, which killed 12 people. Um, there was also an early morning bombing in Rafah uh, and all. Uh, well, I'm sorry, there wasn't one bombing. There were several bombings which took place in Rafah. In other words, the Israelis are not going to comply with this resolution, period. And we mentioned that just yesterday on this show. And I'm gonna tell you one of the reasons why they're not going to comply. Now, some people out there might be sitting there saying, but wait a minute, even the United States of America said, yo, it's time to stop. Come on, y'all, it's time to stop. But why aren't they listening to the Americans? Well, listen to this from uh, the spokesperson uh, for the State Department in Washington that he's having with a, a journalist who's asking some very basic questions. Just take a quick listen, and this is going to make more sense to you. Check it out. It's a little bit mind-boggling to me. Since when is a UN resolution Security Council UN resolution not non-binding uh, because that's a significant shift. That's not the understanding of most countries, and it's not the understanding of the UN either. This is not a Chapter Seven uh, resolution, uh, so I don't get how the U.S. is now saying that it would be non-binding and basically giving the message that another country wouldn't necessarily need to comply with it. So let me uh, explain what we meant by that. First of all, as we uh, said yesterday, and we've made clear all along, we have always believed that the path to a ceasefire and the release of hostages is something that will um, be reached through negotiations uh, between Israel and Hamas, uh, enabled by third party countries uh, in, in, and in which the United States is participating, and not through a UN process. And that remains our uh, belief. <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, we when we say the resolution is non-binding, what we mean is that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties the way, for example, some UN resolutions that uh, uh, impose obligatory sanctions, impose actual requirements on people to implement them. That said, we do believe that even though there are uh, this resolution lacks non-binding pr provisions and lacks um, uh, new requirements that it is imposed on the parties, it does carry weight and it is something that should be implemented. I mean, that's a little bit contradictory, if I may. I mean, he, either it's binding or it's non-binding. If it's non-binding, like you said, because it lacks provisions, why would anybody comply with it? It's non-binding in that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties, but we do believe it should be respected, that it carries weight, and that it should be implemented, as has always been the case, as always been our belief when it comes to UN Security Council resolutions. Okay, y'all got that. It should be respected. But if it isn't, I mean... How about if your son or your daughter says, um, mom, can I use the keys? Uh, where are the keys? And you say, um, listen, son, or listen, daughter, uh, no, you cannot use the car, even though the keys are right over there on the table. And then the, the, the child goes over and picks up the keys, and then the, per then the mother says, well, you know what? You should listen to what I'm saying. You're not going to say you should listen to what I'm saying. You're going to say you better listen to what I'm saying because it's obligatory. But that is, um, but th th that that's the game that's being played now. In the United States, first of all, yesterday they tried to say, yeah, but it's non-binding, and then everybody around the world was saying, wait a minute, non-binding? It's a United Nations Security Council resolution. How did it get to be non-binding? And then today he's saying, well, non-binding means there's nothing new in it. What the heck does nothing new and non-binding mean? It has no connection. But that's the game that's being played, and that's why you still have the killing that's going on in Rafah, 
the killing that's continuing uh, in Khan Yunus and in other places because the United States is providing, once again, cover for them. Now, let's just, um, let's listen to what Francesca Albanese, who is the special rapporteur for the U United Nations, she said something important. It's about a minute. I want you to take a listen to it, and then I'm going to show you something. Take a look. Take a listen to this. I find that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the crime of genocide against Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with a requisite intent, causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. In this darkest hour, the international community cannot continue to ignore that it's Israel's project to rid Palestine of Palestinians in defiance of international law and the world's failure to call Israel to account that has led to genocide laid bare in Gaza. Denial of the reality and the continuation of Israel's impunity and exceptionalism is no longer viable. Okay, so that's the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Francesca Alpo, is making it very clear. She believes wholeheartedly that it's reached the threshold of genocide. Now, let's just play with the words here for a little bit. Let's say it didn't quite make it there. What are we still talking about here? And if it did cross the, the threshold of genocide, then it's even worse. Now, when you've got this type of killing going on, this wholesale slaughter, and yet the United States of America continues to provide cover. Now let's take a listen, uh, or, or I should say, let's take a, a, a listen to some statements that are made by some of the Netanyahu government. You gotta understand something, um, brothers and sisters, this is not hidden. This is in front of everybody's face. And what is said by Almag Cohen, who's an Israeli Knesset member, uh, who said during a TV interview, calling on the Israeli prime minister to take advantage of Ramadan to invade Rafah city and kill Palestinians while they are tired and fasting. He said, quote, during Ramadan, now is the best time to kill them. You can Google it yourself. You can take a listen. Uh, Almag Cohen, he said, during Ramadan, is during Ramadan, now is the best time to kill them. This is a Knesset member speaking in this fashion. And then we go National Missions Minister, Orit Struk, who said that, quote, the Palestinian people do not exist. There is no such thing, she went on to say. There is no Palestinian people. This land is the land of the people of Israel, including Gaza Strip and the West Bank. These are not isolated statements. These statements have been going on, ongoing for a long time. And people have got to realize, understand that a genocide, if you go back to 1994 to Rwanda, the statements of genocide, the statements of dehumanization, the statements of calling people to mass slaughter, they weren't hidden. They were on um, Radio Demil Cologne. It was on the radio calling the people to go out to kill. Uh, Tutsi, uh, 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 Tutsi tribe members. It was the Hutus against the Tutsis. And it was on the radio. It wasn't something that's hidden. A genocide is widespread slaughter. And therefore, it can't be something that's under the table, a whisper, a wink, and a nod. No, it has to be something that is big enough to encompass large numbers of people to go out and to make these types of killings. That's the reality of the situation, brothers and sisters. Okay, we're going to move on to something else that I wanted to um, call you guys to, but... While we've got you guys here, hey, listen, if you guys are out there, why don't you give us a salam? Just send us a quick message telling us where you're joining in from. This is the BAK Show. We are discussing 
um, issues which are important to you. It'll help the algorithm to bring more people in so that they can watch the show as well. So hit that like, hit that share button, and just send us a salam alaikum. Hey, I'm coming in from uh, New Zealand or wherever the case is. Okay, everybody. Let's get back into what we were talking about here. Okay. Um, uh, changing tunes here, we're going to talk about the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now, as everybody knows, the Houthis have been um, uh, firing upon using missiles and drones, uh, ships which have a connection to Israel, either going to Israel or coming from Israel. And they are um, operating in the Red Sea area. Um, that Red Sea area leads to the Suez Canal where the ships go to um, um, through the Suez Canal and into the port of Haifa, which is in occupied Palestine. Now, the uh, Houthis have extended that to the Cape of Good Hope also because they want to stop ships from going around the Horn of Africa, uh, um, uh, uh, I should say around Africa in its entirety uh, to reach uh, the Israeli uh, ports. But he said something, one of the leaders of the Houthi uh, uh, rebels, that, that's Muhammad Ali al Houthi, who is a member of the group's Supreme Political Council. He had a message for Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. He said, we renew our warnings that any country that would act against our country would make its interest a legitimate target for us. He went on to warn Saudi Arabia that the country, quote, would be a target for us if they provided aid and support to the U.S. British aggression against our country, end quote. Now, currently, uh, Saudi Arabia is not uh, uh, American planes which are going to bomb uh, Yemeni territory are currently not going through Saudi Arabia. That's currently. However, he's warning them to make sure that they understand that should that dynamic change, that would make Saudi Arabia a legitimate target. Going back some, uh, 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 some time ago, the Houthis began to bomb the oil depots in Saudi Arabia using drones that the Saudis were powerless to stop. That's the reality of the situation, and that's how messy things are getting in, um, in the region. Uh, moving on from that, um, uh, very briefly, um, all right, let's take a look and see what, what, what kind of uh, questions you guys might have. If you've got a question, a comment, or concern, now is the time. We're going to be uh, eager to entertain it. This is your show, so let's see what you guys are talking about. Um, okay, we're here. Uh, Amin, Amin. Assalamu alaikum, Akhir Kareem. Wa alaikum, Salaam, wa rahmatullahi, wa barakatuh. What do you think about the Moscow attack? Women say it's Ukraine, some say it's ISIS, and is there a threat to Europe and America of more ISIS attacks? May Allah guide tech theories. I mean, um, well, uh, when it comes to uh, groups like ISIS, uh, anything is possible. I don't believe that there is a central governing body governing these attacks. I think you've got local cells um, who, who who pull off the uh, certain attacks, and it is being exacerbated by the media that this is all one entity. It's not. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, do I think that there's a threat to Europe and America? Um, I think that there is a legitimate threat to Europe and America, and the question is why. When you are aiding and abetting a genocide, that's going to make people unhappy. And sometimes people, in their displeasure, uh, 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 lash out in ways that they should not be. And that attack, which took place in Moscow, was an attack that should not have happened. Because attacking just regular concert goers, I don't see how that furthers anyone's interests. It, it, it just, it seems to make no sense to me. It's different if you're attacking a military installation or something along those lines. 
But the Prophet Sallallahu didn't call for attacks on those types of people. He would attack people uh, um, that either were combatants or they used to participate by way of their uh, voluntarily giving money to the war effort against the Muslims, or he would attack people who uh, uh, participated against the Muslims um, with their ideas. For example, they may be 70, 80, 90 years old, but they say, I have good um, um, experience in war, and I'm telling you how to hit and how to attack the Muslims. Those people are people who are um, uh, uh, who are militarily accountable. And finally, he would attack people who um, would incite to attacks on the Muslims. So we're talking about people who incite to attacks, those who participate with their ideas, those who voluntarily participate with their money. I'm not talking about obligatory taxes here. And um, those who are active combatants. And those concert goers didn't fall into uh, under any of those categories. So um, I, I don't see um, how those attacks uh, could fit in any way, shape, form, or fashion under the banner of Islam. Now, that's assuming that these people actually did it because they were trying to do some type of Islamic deed or something along those lines, even though they might have missed the target. Um, I have my doubts um, about it. I listened to some of the answers in which they gave. It sounds like they were just hired to do a certain thing and it didn't work out. And then somehow they became ISIS members. Um, it was spoken about that there was a telegram uh, channel that is an ISIS telegram channel and they took responsibility for it. Dude, if there was an ISIS telegram channel, it would have been shut down. And I didn't see no address of no ISIS tele telegram channel. You're asking me to believe Vladimir Putin, Joe Biden, and these other people who are known liars? Of course, I won't be believing them. That's the reality of the situation. And I don't think that you should be believing them either. Um, we've got uh, Amor Khan who says, what role can we play as individuals living in the West apart from demonstrating as that feels non-productive? Is social media really making a difference in current situation? Oh yes, brother. Oh yes. Let me be the first one to let you know. Because going back some years ago, people used to get all of their news and information from major media corporations, CNN, BBC, ABC, CBS, Fox News, and so on and so forth. These big media corporations are dominated by Israeli friendly funds. So with that in mind, imagine if you take away the advent of social media, what do you have left? we probably wouldn't even be talking about Gaza right now. It wouldn't even be a topic, but it's a big topic, a very big topic. And why is that? Because of people like you. Because people like yourself, they get up, they see, they type, they raise their voices, they share, they like, they condemn, and they do all sorts of things online. And it makes a huge impact, not a small impact, a huge impact. And the enemy wants nothing more than for you to feel powerless, that you can't go on anymore. What's the point? Well, the reality of the is that so many of the um, uh, 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 things which have happened in Gaza, the famine that's going on, the entire planet knows about it. Why? Through social media. That's big. Because so many times I will see things that take place and I'm like, wow. Um, such and such a bombing took place. And then I will go on the major news uh, uh, organizations, BBC, CNN, and some of those other ones to see what they're saying about it. They don't say anything until social media is abuzz with it. Then they will come out and say that some Palestinians died after an Israeli attack, did they die? Would, would they die of what? Die of heart attacks? No, they were killed. But I digress. The point of the matter here is that a lot of these big major media corporations are very, very pro-Israel and Israeli friendly, and they will not report a lot of the goings on that's, that, that are taking place unless social media is abuzz with it. And that's where you guys come in. So please 
Brothers and sisters, don't feel like you're not making an impact because you are making an impact big time. If we go back to 1994, the, uh, the uh, genocide which took place in Rwanda. I keep bringing that up because that was the most recent one. But um, that's the East African nation where over a million people were killed in 100 days. And when I talk about weapons of mass destruction, mostly they were killed by bullets and machetes. Now, at that time, you only got the news from the major news corporations. And all the news corporations at that time, at least in the beginning, they weren't so interested in a bunch of Africans killing each other. That's real, brothers and sisters. Bunch of Africans killing each other. Yeah, well, that's what they do. That's the, the position that a lot of these um, major media corporations had. But then eventually the word got out and it exploded. But the point of the matter is, is that they only report that which is pro their narrative unless people like you are active and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, we've got the Wazish Khan. Iran attacks Sunni Muslim Pakistan. Sunni Idlib, Sunni Afghanistan of Taliban, but never attacks Israel or USA directly. This is exactly what Khawadi's psychotic Daesh did attacking every Muslim. Yeah, if you look at it, um, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of what you say is right. Um, I mean, if you've got, if you even look at their proxies, uh, Hezbollah, yeah, they have some cross border skirmishes with uh, the Israelis, but now is not the time for a cross border skirmish. It ain't the time for that. It's time for a fight, it's time for war. When you see that the people are being starved, starved to death, it's not the time for cross-border skirmishes. You hit me, I throw one at you. Uh, what you gonna do, huh? Uh, okay then, that's what I thought. It's not time for that. And to be real with you, I'm not convinced of uh, Hezbollah's uh, sincerity to, uh, uh, to defend uh, the Muslims in, uh, uh, in the Palestinian territories. I'm not convinced of that. They've got some stuff over there. They've got uh, plenty of missiles and so on and so forth. And I mean, if when people are being bombed and starved isn't enough for you to call all out war, um, then I don't really know what is. I just don't. I wish I did, but I don't. And Allah knows best. Next item up for bids, Bismillah. Salam, Brother Bilal. Thank you for all you do for the Ummah. Jazakallah I appreciate that. Um, should we be voting for Trump or just don't vote at all? Um, I would never, ever, in any kind of weather, encourage anybody to vote for Donald Trump. And I would never, ever, in any kind of weather, encourage anybody to vote for genocide Joe Biden. Now, after having, having said that, Who? Look, I can't tell you who to, who, who, who to vote for, but I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to feel something that, you know what? I don't think either one of them guys are going to win. I think that there is a high possibility that neither of them are going to make it to the finish line. Well, what am I talking about? Donald Trump has got so many legal issues it's April 15th is, a, is, his, is his, the start of his trial um, for hush money payments, which were made to a porn star, Stormy Daniels. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's married, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and that's when his, tr his trial starts because he said that they used campaign funds to pay off this porn star and all. Listen to these, these allegations, wild stuff, y'all. We're not talking about small stuff. Dude, you paid off a porn star. Why are you paying it off? What y'all got going on? Oh, I digress. The point of the matter here is, is that uh, Donald Trump might be in prison. That's the first thing. And he's got a bunch of other legal issues that um, I'm not gonna say might disqualify him because you could have a president who's in prison. You can, he could still run. And 
the wet people are going to be so interested in somebody that's on lockdown, um, you know, 23 hours a day running the country. I just kind of feel like I don't think that people are going to be up for that. As for Genocide Joe, this cat looks like he's just getting ready to keel over and die. Um, you, you know, uh, he, he's he, he, he doesn't do interviews. He doesn't do these Q and A's. If you notice, you haven't seen him do that in a very long time. Why? Because he's not right. He's finished. He's too old. It's over for him. So the point that I'm trying to make here is just stay tuned. There may be some major changes on the horizon and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but I'd never tell you to vote for Trump, never tell you to vote for Genocide Joe. Next. Iran also attacks Sunni Kurdish areas in Iraq. Well, that's what they do. That's what they're committed to. So don't fall asleep on the Iranians. Don't. They help out Hamas um, and Hamas from them. But you got to understand something. They are not pro-Sunni groups. They may bankroll them, arm them for their own reasons, but not because they support the cause. And that's real and Allah knows best. Um, we've got here uh, Zionist Guardian USA released 10 billion US dollars for Iran just before October 7th. Is it a coincidence? Absolutely not. Um, you might be right. Uh, I'm just not sure. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. So we'll have to look for more information um, you know, uh, regarding that. Okay, we've got uh, Liu Yunfu who says, Yahi Bilal, I'd like to know what the situation in Syria, the controlled area of Bash Bashar Assad and other control. Um, also, our UK brother who was imprisoned by Tahrir some years back, how's he doing? All right, well, firstly, um, we've got here the situation in Syria. Protests are ongoing um, uh, to remove Abu Muhammad Jolani, who's the leader of Sham, um, uh, from uh, his position and his entire inner circle. Um, Joe Lanny is trying to ride out the protests, hoping that the people will get tired before they uh, run him out. Um, that's the situation um, right now. Uh, uh, widespread confirmed um, cases of systemic uh, torture and murder of prisoners, um, finding of a security uh, 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 personnel graveyard where. Um, the murdered prisoners were buried. It's a big, big, big mess here. Big mess here. And we're hoping that the good people will stay active and will keep on working. So uh, I am hoping and praying for the fall of Abu Muhammad Jolani, while not necessarily hoping for the pray uh, and praying for the fall of all of the institutions so that anarchy can reign. But we'll have to wait and see how that's going to play out. But we absolutely will not be able to advance the cause of the Muslims and the Syrian people until Abu Muhammad Jolani and those who are like him have been done away with and Allah knows best. You also meant also our UK brother who was in prison by Tahrir some years back. I think you mean Tawqiyah Taqshiri. Uh, he's fine. Um, I saw him just about three days ago. And uh, he, he's doing great. Alhamdulillah. Um, Harun Fiaz, who says, brother, only the, the, the Khilafah can protect us. All right, uh, look, um, I can dig what you're saying, but there ain't no Khilafah right now. So what does that mean exactly? Um, I hear what you're saying and you're right, because that is the shield of the Ummah, but there's no Khalifa right now. So what do we do? Do we wait for him to come? Do we keep working to make the, uh, the atmosphere conducive for a centralized leadership? Because the atmosphere is not conducive to that right now. And I believe that it isn't nearly conducive to that. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot more work than we're currently putting into it. Um, so uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I just, I'm just not seeing 
what those statements will actually translate to on the ground and Allah knows best. Um, M.A. says, Salaam Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam Sarkatu. I heard some scholars are saying Israel will fall in 2027. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I'm up for it, but I have no idea what they're basing that on. I have no idea um, what, what they're basing that on. And Allah knows best. Okay, we've got Mr. Khan who's back. He says, Brother Bilal, kindly ask rubble groups in uh, Idlib to start digging wide network of underground tunnels like Hamas um, to resist any invasion by evil alliance of Iran, Russia, Assad in the future. Um, listen, brother man, let me be honest with you here. I'm gonna come at you hard here. The reality of the situation is that we don't know who Joe Lanny works for. We don't know. I do know that when uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah Muhaysani uh, had a big trench um, uh, project wherein they would dig tunnels and trenches so that they could defend the territory. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Muhaysani, he got his own money from his own sources and required nothing from Hayat Tahrir Sham to build those tunnels. Who shut it down? Abu Muhammad Jolani and Hayat Tahrir Sham. I stand by what I said. It was Abu Muhammad Jolani, Hayat Tahrir Sham, who called Dr. Abdullah Muhaysani and told him to his face, shut the project down. That's what they told him to do. So, and then shortly thereafter, some months after that, those territories where the project was that was being well-funded and was ongoing, all of a sudden got overran by regime forces and those territories were lost. Brothers and sisters, I'm giving it to you straight. I am here, I was there. I visited those areas. I did reports from those tunnels. They were very well done, well-funded. The brothers put a lot of work into it and who shut it down? Abu Muhammad Jolani and Hayat Tahrir Shah. So um, the situation is much bigger than just making preparation because Jolani has given territory away, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, given territory away that was not lost on battlefields. Okay. Um, all right, we've got Joad here who says, um, the difference is that Biden is from the establishment and Trump is anti-establishment. Trump's not anti-establishment. I can dig what you're saying. Um, rhetoric is different from Joe Biden's, but he's not anti-establishment. If you vote for Joe Biden or you vote for Donald Trump, what does that mean uh, in terms of relations with Israel? Nothing, nothing's changed. It's all the same. Um, people might say, oh, well, Donald Trump banned the Muslims from coming in from certain countries uh, uh, and, and all. Joe Biden didn't do that. Okay, yeah, Joe Biden didn't do that. Yeah, he just armed Israel so that he could kill, so, so, so that they could commit a genocide. Which, you know, what are we talking about here? The rhetoric changes, but they are the same. They're against Muslims, they're against Islam. And somebody may say, ah, oh, come on, Bilal, there's more than just Muslims and Islam. Uh, you, know, you know, there's the economy and there's the other stuff. And I'm gonna tell it to you like this, I'm Muslim. And I view who's good and who's bad based upon their positions uh, regarding our national and international struggle for freedom from these tyrannical rulers who are bankrolled and backed by Washington and Downing Street. That's how I think, not likely to change, and that's how I think the rest of the Ummah needs to look at things. Don't fall for this rhetoric about what well, we need to be thinking more about um, what they say internationally about the Chinese and all. Ain't Chinese. And I'm gonna be thinking more of what they say about the brothers and sisters before I'm going to be thinking about some trade agreements with Beijing. I'm going to tell it to you straight, that don't mean a lot to me. 
But it means a lot to me when you're aiding and abetting a genocide. It means a lot to me when you're saying that we're going to ban Muslims from coming into the country. It means a lot to me when you're saying that we're going to continue to give Israel what it needs to defend itself. Defend itself from what? There's a famine going on. There's a genocide going on. Defend themselves for what? So, brothers and sisters, just so you understand where my priorities are, you can take my statements with a different backdrop and understand where they're coming from. And Allah knows best. All right, now we're going to take one last one. And we've got Mr. Khan is back. He said, Jolani is reported to have talked with Russia to compromise and not disturb Russia and Essen in their 90% controlled Syria. That's why Jolani did U-turn to rule whatever is left of, uh, of, of Idlib. Um, somebody told me going back some years ago, they said, listen, Bilal, I know Joe Lanny personally, and I know how he thinks. If Joe Lanny can implement the Sharia of Islam, he would like that. If Joe Lanny can't implement the Sharia of Islam, he won't mind that. He said the only thing that's important to him is that he has a territory that he can govern, period. That's all that's important to Joe Lanny. This was told to me in 2015. It's 2024. That was a very, very correct assessment. When you have somebody who has no red line, and he has no red line from what I'm seeing, then anything is possible. So he's looking for a land grab. Why? He, I've been hearing for years that Hayat Tahrir Sham is going to merge with other groups. They're going to merge with uh, 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 Watani, um, the Euphrates Shield areas groups, and the uh, Olive Branch groups. And I said at that time, and I say now, it's not going to happen. Why? Because Jolani cannot exist this except that he is the leader and he is controlling the security and the military and the financial aspects of it because he is a tyrant and a volume and a tyrant and a volume cannot exist in a space with other people. He can't. For example, that's like saying that Bashar al-Assad all of a sudden is going to become just a member, uh, a member of parliament and there's other leaders there. The first one that's going to get hauled into court is going to be Bashar al-Assad and arrested. Same thing with Abu Muhammad Jolani. Who could forgive the, uh, all of the killings and the torturings and the giving away of land and the um, uh, uh, inflation of prices because he has a monopoly? Nobody could forgive that except that he goes to court and he's tried for it. That's the reality of the situation. But brothers and sisters, we have to know how they play the game. Anyway, guys, look, man, I love talking to you guys. I love your responses. Jazakumullah khair. We will be back tomorrow night. Up. Let's hope and pray for some, uh, uh, some good news for our brothers and sisters in Palestine, our brothers and sisters that are in Sudan and in other places. I am your host, Bilal Abdul Kareem. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi